Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be presenting the research um, that I am conducting currently with my Kistelmans uh, on a very unique uh, medieval Dutch manuscript collection. Um, now, this presentation is structured as follows. Um, first, I will share some details and uh, intriguing aspects about the manuscript collection uh, and why it is so very important from a literary perspective. Uh, and next I will present the HDR process that we went through to transcribe all of these materials for which we used Transcribus. And then I will set out to conduct several experiments um, with the objective of assessing the performance of, of these various HDR models and seeing um, what are specific conditions and how uh, specific um, um, experiments are uh, influencing these HDR models. Uh, because the manuscript collection that I'm presenting here um, is very unique. It's a very unique microcosm, so to speak, where one can control for the effect of, of many different aspects. Uh, and in this sense, we will use Transcribus to inform us about the contents of these manuscripts, but also the other way around, we can use the manuscripts to inform us about the performance of HDR models trained with Transcribus. And then finally, I will also be um, uh, delving into some fascinating preliminary uh, findings from our work. So the manuscripts collection uh, that will be the focus of this presentation is produced in the monastery of Herne, some, uh, some 30 kilometers southwest of Brussels. And the cultural importance of this monastery and its manuscript collection is very hard to overestimate. In the second half of the 14th century, it served as the proverbial hotspot for the production, negotiation, and dissemination of uh, vernacular literature in the Low Countries. To comprehend the monastery's uh, significance, we can consider its contributions both from a, a qualitative perspective and from a literary perspective, a uh, quantitative perspective, sorry. First and foremost, the monastery is known for producing texts that, um, that have a monumental uh, importance. The most famous example here is um, its Bible translation. It makes this very small monastery really stand out uh, also internationally. In this very small monastery, the very first near-complete Bible translation into a European vernacular, into prose, um, was realized. And up until today, this Bible translation uh, remains still very influential. Interestingly, this Bible translation, but also other texts from this monastery, uh, contain uh, very lengthy prologues where um, the author or the scribe is commenting on uh, his illnesses while he's writing, or uh, uh, the audience that he's making these texts for. Um, and some of these prologues, they also make abundantly clear that translating texts from Latin into a vernacular language was a very risky uh, business at the time. Outside of the religious domain, these uh, scribes, uh, they also copied numerous texts on ethical teachings and historiography. And a lot of these texts are only known to us today because, uh, because of these scribal efforts of these monks at this monastery, saving these materials from oblivion. However, and this is very intriguing also, never, never, never do these texts contain a self-attribution. So we rarely get to know the actual names of the scribes or the people uh, translating these texts. Uh, it's almost as if these monks uh, on purpose tried to remain invisible, nameless. The manuscripts that survive from this monastery, they are also very imp uh, impressive by the numbers. The material legacy of this monastery is very huge, and um, for this period in time in the Low Countries, there is no similar production center that even comes close in terms of scribal output. For the period of uh, 1350 up until 1400, um, this monastery is credited with producing 54 manuscript booklets and full manuscripts. Collectively, all these texts amount to approximately 5,500 uh, folia, or roughly 1.2 million words. All right, now, who was responsible for translating all these texts? After a very careful uh, codicological and paleographic survey, um, the paleographer Eric Quackel was able to identify 13 distinct handwritings in these manuscripts that he presumes originate from uh, the Herne Monastery. Quackel also pointed out that there was a very strong sense of collaboration 
that existed between these individual scribes who reviewed, corrected, and copied each other's work uh, quite extensively. And one crucial aspect hasn't been mentioned yet, um, and this makes these uh, collaborations even more intriguing, and this is the fact that these, Carthusian, uh, that these monks were in fact Carthusians who lead lives of meditative silence, only on very, very rare occasions were they allowed to use their voices. And as a consequence of this silent solitude, these monks were required to develop creative strategies uh, and solutions for communicating during their scribal efforts. And some of their interactions have been uh, documented as marginal annotations uh, in their manuscripts. Uh, this allows us, modern scholars today, to uh, sort of peek over their shoulders as they are negotiating their text. This is very much like a Google Doc that you share with your colleagues and where you have people um, intervening in your text. On this slide, for instance, you see that uh, a leaf from a particular manuscript which testifies to, uh, to the very close cooperation between scribe alpha and uh, scribe beta. Now, in recent years, a lot of the uh, research that has been conducted on this monastery um, had a particular focus on uncovering the identities of these people, most notably the infamous Bible translator. However, uh, despite dedicated efforts, this quest has proven, proven to be uh, largely unsuccessful uh, as the available sources uh, stubbornly resist uh, attributions. Moreover, previous research also heavily relied on paleographic and codicological uh, analyses to identify, to identify these scribal hands. Um, and our understanding of the handwriting styles is all, also largely dependent on the expertise of scholars like Eric Quackel, who has undoubtedly made remarkable uh, contributions in recognizing the distinct features of these handwriting styles. However, it is worth noting that their writing styles often are also very similar. In our current project, Mike and I, we are shifting away um, our focus from this pursuit to their, uh, their pers the pursuit for their personal names of these scribes, and we are instead approaching their scribal efforts with respect, uh, with respect for their anonymity. Our aim is to explore the uh, linguistic characteristics that define their collective scribal activities, while also delving into the idiosyncratic elements that differentiate them from each other in terms of language. Uh, and writing style. By adopting this comprehensive approach, we hope to gain deeper insight into how these scribes converged as a community and how distinct linguistic features uh, both unite them as a group but also set them apart uh, as individuals. However, to conduct this kind of research, we need a good digital corpus. We need uh, a good digital um, uh, facsimiles of these materials from Herne a collection of transcripts that stays very close to the actual sources to enable fine-grained analyses. And for this, we resort to, uh, to the wonderful tool Transcribus for text recognition, simply because it would be too much uh, work to manually transcribe all these texts um, ourselves. So first of all, we collected high-quality digital facsimiles of the entire manuscript collection. And um, so all the manuscripts that are currently associated with this monastery and then we have produced sizable sample transcripts of nearly every document in the corpus. Uh, in total, we manually transcribed close to 1,200 folia, and this we is both Mike and I, and I would also like to thank Anouk Kuipers, um, who is an undergrad at the University of Antwerp, and who also really contributed uh, to making these transcripts. And the transcription standard that we used, we like to call hyper-diplomatic, because we have meticulously and also painstakingly transcribed every glyph every abbreviation mark, every uh, punctuation mark on the manuscript page. And for this, we used the uh, medieval Unicode font initiative, or MUFI, uh, which serves as the key point of reference for encoding and displaying uh, special characters in medieval texts. Right. Currently, we have completed the uh, manual transcription phase. So the next step was then to use all of these materials to sort of create a grand medieval Dutch model that then could be applied onto the remaining folia uh, to produce automatic transcriptions. By pooling together all of this data and training a comprehensive model, we managed to reach a character error rate of 2.7 on the validation set, meaning that on average 2.7 out of 100 characters are still recognized incorrectly when compared 
when comparing the produced HDR output to the actual ground truth output. And this result is very encouraging because it strengthens our belief that we have obtained a very dynamic model um, that is able to um, automatically transcribe different scribal hands, uh, different layouts, different um, thematic contents, and different spelling profiles. However, we can also ask ourselves, is it really a good idea to train a model uh, on material that contains so much variation? Is it a good idea to allow all that variation when uh, we want to apply an HDR model, for example, onto a manuscript that is copied by one and the same scribe, uh, for which we could just as well train a more dedicated, more tailor-made uh, specific model? So the overarching question here is to what extent does variation uh, assist HDR models in producing accurate automatic transcriptions. So to investigate this, we have confronted the grand uh, medieval Dutch model with a structured patchwork of smaller case studies that shed light on the effect of various experimental conditions. And for this, we have constructed different trained target combinations in the available material. Here we have an initial experiment. What if we trained uh, models based on uh, only uh, 15,000 words for the two most prolific scribes in our corpus, alpha and beta. We have selected training sets of 15,000 words and two stable validation sets of uh, 22,000 words each. Um, I'm not going to discuss all of the uh, individual figures in this table, but I will highlight the most important results. For instance, a model specifically trained on material uh, from scribe alpha achieves a very impressive CER of 2.56%. Um, this is significantly better than when we train a grand model that has never seen Alpha's handwriting. So a model trained, uh, the model that has seen different contemporary scribal hands, but never Alpha's, makes over as, uh, twice as many uh, mistakes. Moreover, if we apply uh, a model trained on scribe Alpha's material, onto Beta's validation set, uh, this model makes uh, more than three times uh, as many errors. So in, in short, it is greatly advantageous for the model to have encountered the scribe's handwriting. A second interesting case study presents itself um, when we consider the writing style of a single scribe, in this case, specifically that of Beta. And Beta was sort of a chameleon. He actually had three different uh, handwriting styles or writing modes that he could use. He had a high, very clean, very pronounced, very legible uh, kind of writing style. And then there is his medium writing style, somewhat more rushed. Um, and then there is his, uh, his low style that he only occasionally uses when writing very short notes. We have trained a, uh, models again, each time on 15,000 words for his high and his medium style. For the low style, there's not enough material. Um, and we also trained a more general model um, where the training material consists of 50% high uh, handwriting and 50% medium style handwriting. And the question now is what is the effect of switching between these different writing modes from the same, from the same scribe? It's clear that a model exclusively trained and applied um, onto the neat style achieves the best score. So what is the easiest for the human, for a human to read, is also the easiest for the HDR model to read. Using this model, however, on his medium style um, results in a very substantial decrease in performance. And finally, um, an interesting result to note here is that a model trained on the 50-50 uh, uh, sample of both the high and medium style uh, creates some confusion when applied to the pure validation set of the high style. This increased variation in the training material appears to present some challenges here in uh, the transcription process. Interestingly, this, vari this variety provides a slight boost when it comes to recognizing the medium style. So to sum up, it appears that deciphering a very clean, well-formed, very high, uh, very legible script uh, using a dedicated model has its benefits. However, when it comes to interpreting uh, a somewhat sloppier uh, handwriting, exposure for a model to uh, a broader range of variation could actually be beneficial. All right, to this point, we've discussed various uh, experiments, 
And I'd like to briefly touch upon the evaluation of, of HDR models. Anyone who has worked with Transcribus is undoubtedly familiar with this screen that displays the CER score for both the training uh, set and the validation set. These percentages, they, they provide a, a very fair idea of the overall performance of the model, but they're not exactly insightful. For instance, if you want to understand how well digits are recognized um, uh, or compared to Latin letters, for example, these numbers, they don't provide a lot of clarity. Furthermore, all discrepancies between the HDR output and the ground truth um, are considered in the calculation. Um, so while this is very appropriate, in some projects, for example in mine, I'm not really interested in digits, so I, would, I, won't, I don't like to take this into account when calculating the CER. And to make the outputs of any kind of HDR model uh, more understandable, I've developed a tool that is completely platform independent, um, and you can compare the results from, uh, I'm gonna take a sip of water. You can compare the results from both Transcribus with those of Kraken or any kind of other uh, HDR program. Um, and this tool is called Cerberus. It's a graphical user interface for calculating CER scores um, that you can locally navigate on your browser. It offers uh, several features, such as uh, character confusion statistics, which enable a very thorough analysis of your HDR model's uh, strengths and weaknesses. All right, this is what the interface looked like. There are two uh, text boxes uh, where you can paste the ground truth for the H, uh, and the HDR processed uh, variant of a text. And this can be done simply by dragging the text files into these boxes. Next, you can have the option to um, enable or disable uh, different features, such as disabling all uh, punctuation or case sensitivity, digits, white spaces, new lines. They can also be ignored when you're calculating the CER. You can also define code blocks, ranges of Unicode points uh, for which you want to calculate the CER. So in my project, for instance, I'm really interested in these uh, very specific movie characters uh, and how well they are uh, being recognized. And then on the results page, uh, you, you will see some general statistics about, uh, about the overall CER and the number of substitutions, deletions, and insertions. And in addition, you can also examine how well the model is recognizing um, all different characters. Uh, the block statistics, they provide an overview of the specific uh, collections of characters. But perhaps most interestingly are the confusion statistics, uh, which provide insight into how often a character is mistaken for another character. And here you can also create a very convenient graph that allows you to inspect uh, those confusions. So this is the initial version of this tool. I'm very, uh, you can find it on GitHub and I'm very willing to add other features uh, to it or cooperate with anyone interested in it. All right, I'm almost at the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to share one um, serendipitous uh, discovery. Um, now that we have all these texts in a digital format, um, uh, we have transcribed all the, the manuscripts from the Herne Monastery, we can subject them to a stylometric uh, study. Here, for example, you can see a cluster analysis based on character two grams. And what this plot shows uh, is the stylistic similarities between the different text samples of various scribes. Um, in the top, we notice that all of the samples by scribe alpha, they cluster together, which is evidence for uh, stylistic similarity. However, the samples of other manuscripts, namely uh, the samples from the Viennese Codex uh, 65, uh, we find in the lower half, quite separated from Alpha's other writings. And this is quite odd. After careful inspection and other analyses, we now believe uh, that this manuscript was in fact not written by this uh, famous scribe Alpha. And although it might uh, appear to be a very trivial detail that Alpha was not the scribe of this uh, manuscript, it has very significant impl implications because the assumption that Alpha was the scribe uh, uh, of this manuscript and a resident of this monastery uh, has also led to the belief that the other scribal hand that can be found in this manuscript was also, uh, must also have been a resident of this, of this monastery. However, with Alpha not being the scribe, this connection becomes uncertain uh, and this finding is like tipping over a domino that causes 
kind of a chain reaction, uh, and as a result, the connection between other manuscripts also uh, is now uncertain. So this goes to show that our linguistic analyses uh, support a need to reevaluate which manuscripts are definitely linked to this Herna monastery and which ones have unclear connections. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. I would like to share uh, one final thought with you. Um, Herna, the Herna monastery is a very interesting case in so many respects. It's for sale right now. Um, just under um, one million euros. So if, you, if we all chip in, I think this could be a very nice refuge for all HDR enthusiasts. Thank you. <laughs>